There we go. I want to thank you all for, um, for coming this afternoon. I want to thank the organizers of the conference for uh, inviting us to, uh, to speak to you. Um, my talk today is uh, going to start with uh, just sort of a brief description of my research program. So um, for the last few years, I've been studying uh, a phenomenon known as interoception. So interoception, uh, interoception can be thought of as the awareness of the internal state of the body. All right, it involves the detection by the brain of the numerous uh, visceral, primarily visceral signals uh, about things like heart rate and stomach distension and bladder distension, that when we integrate all these signals together, we learn something about um, our internal milieu. It sort of tells us. So interoception is important because it's one of the ways that our brains um, recognize our physiological needs. And lacking interoceptive awareness, it's difficult to organize behaviors to meet those needs, right? So this is, uh, this is a survival skill, right? So if you can't recognize that you're hungry, it's going to be hard to organize behaviors to go out and get food to meet that need. Now, I'd been studying interoception for a while, and um, uh, Justin Feinstein was recruited to come to, uh, to Tulsa, to the Laureate Institute for Brain Research, or LIBER, as we call it. And I was really excited about this. I'd known Justin for a while, uh, and, uh, and Justin started telling me about this new idea he had for, for studying interoception. He said, you got to try this out. Um, you got to try this thing called floating. And I thought, well, that's, that's kind of a little different. Uh, and, and Justin said, you know, what this involves is you take off all your clothes, and you get in a tank of, of salty water, and it's completely black, and there's no noise, and you just... You just lie there, right? And I thought, huh, Justin, I'm from Texas. I don't know if we do that sort of thing. <laughs> and and if, if you know Justin, you know, you know that Justin is both enthusiastic and very, uh, sort of very good at convincing people to do things. And, uh, and so, so Justin um, knew that I was going to be coming to visit my wife's family up in, uh, uh, up in Portland. She's from here. And he got me in touch with... Uh, this guy named Dylan, right? So Dylan, who's, I could use my laser pointer and point to Dylan. Um, Dylan uh, is one of the, the owners of the float shop here. And I have to be honest and say that part of the reason why I was, I guess, a little reticent to, to try floating when Justin first described it to me, I mean, I thought it sounded interesting, but I, you know, I'm kind of like a sort of a, by nature, sort of anxious, ruminative person. And the thought of being in that tank with my brain for 90 minutes with no, you know, iPhone or, or email or whatever to sort of distract myself, that didn't sound that pleasant, right? Uh, I sort of imagined that what was going to happen was I was going to get in there and start ruminating, and I think I'm causing too much feedback, sorry guys, uh, that I'd start ruminating and, and just kind of boil off all the water, right? And it would just be me and the salt, like, crusted on the walls, right? <laughs> And, um, and I talked with, with Dylan about this when I got there, and I said, you know, what, do I, what should I expect? And Dylan said the best thing. He said, man, just let it be whatever it is, right? Just, just be with it. And that turned out to be great advice, because I got in, um, and, uh, and this is what I discovered, right? <laughs> you guys know what this is, right? This is a float tank, right? Um, you're, you're, you're in there. It's dark. There's not a lot of sound. And, and I get in the water, and I'm, I'm lying there in the water, and almost immediately I realize, oh, yeah, this is what Justin's talking about. Right? All of a sudden, I could sense, I could be aware of certain bodily signals that I you know, often found very hard to detect when I was just sort of out there in the world. Right? And from the perspective of neuroscience, I, I was really interested in what are the brain systems that underlie this interesting float experience, right? So, so what I was doing in there was I was all of a sudden able to attend to those bodily signals. And, um, 
And that was really interesting, and I, and I felt like I was able to do it very well. And that was interesting because for a couple of years, my lab at Liber had been developing tasks uh, that, that study this exact interoceptive tension inside an MRI scanner. So let me give you an example of what that entails. So uh, in this visceral interoceptive attention task that you're going to see a lot of today, the subject sees on a computer screen that they can see inside the, the scanner, uh, they see either the word, say, heart or stomach, or and sometimes they'll see the word bladder, right? And their job is to simply focus, while they see that word on the screen, focus on the naturally occurring, occurring sensations that they experience uh, from that part of the body. Now, we need a control condition, right, for that. And so for that, we use what we call an exteroceptive attention task. So the subject sees a visual target on the computer screen. And while that's uh, on, the, on the screen, they're supposed to engage in attention to this thing, this visual thing that's outside their body. Does that make sense? Right. And they're doing all this while they're in an MRI scanner. And just to kind of give you a flavor of what brain regions turn out to be really important for this visceral interoceptive attention task, I'm going to tell you first about a study that we did just with, with healthy, uh, 14 right-handed healthy adults um, while they were doing the task. So just to be clear, because, because we're going to talk about this task um, in uh, a couple of, couple of studies, I want you to understand exactly what's happening. So the subject's in the scanner, and they see the word heart on the screen, and their job is to focus. I think I'm being... <laughs> Three things to hold down. So their job is to focus on the beating of their heart when they see the word heart on the screen. Uh, if they see the word stomach on the screen, their job is to focus on the naturally occurring sensations they have in their stomach. So in this case, focus on the fullness of their stomach. Now this task uses, uh, uh, harnesses what we call in, in the neuroscience literature the attentional spotlight effect. So we've known uh, for a long time, for decades now, that when someone focus the, focuses their attention on a specific sensory modality, say vision for example, you get a, a potentiation or an increase in, uh, in activity within the visual cortex, right? Or you get a, 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 a a boost in terms of the activity of the sensory regions in the brain that underlie that, that modality that they're attending to. And our idea here was to use this attentional spotlight effect to identify the brain regions that, are, uh, that underlie the processing of these, these body sensations. So essentially to, to get that attentional spotlight effect to reveal those regions to us. Now as our exteroceptive control condition, the subject saw the word target on the screen and they had to detect any time the word target moved from uppercase to lowercase letters. Okay, so that's the exteroceptive condition. Now, here's what we found. So what we observed was that uh, the exteroceptive condition tended to increase activity in a portion of the uh, dorsal anterior insula, which is this structure here, it's one on each side, whereas the interoceptive condition tended to increase activity more posteriorly in the mid and posterior uh, insula cortex. Okay, now that was interesting to us because of what we know about the wiring diagram of the nervous system. So most of these signals from, say, your heart or from breathing or from your stomach, they travel up the vagus nerve um, to the brain, right? And, uh, and when they reach the brain stem, so, so we, you know, we would describe the vagus nerve as cranial nerve 10. So cranial nerve 10, 10 comes into the solitary nuclear complex, and then from there to a brain region, in the, again in the brain stem, called the parabrachial nucleus, and then from there to the thalamus. And then out of the thalamus, the first place that these uh, visceral interoceptive signals reach the cortex, which is the outer mantle of the, of the brain that does a lot of the more elaborate processing in the brain, the very first place they hit the cortex is in the dorsal, mid, and posterior insula. So that was really exciting to us in light of what we found with our visceral interoceptive attention task, because all of a sudden we knew, yeah, we've got a task that allows us to map in awake humans, viscerosensory cortex, right? This region of the brain that's um, a, a primary player in our perception of these signals. So the dorsal mid insula is the first cortical representation uh, for visceral interoceptive signals conveying the state of the body. Now, dating back to uh, William James, at least some psychologists have placed the physiological state of the body 
at the center of emotional experience. The idea here is that our experience of emotions is grounded in the physical effect, the physical feeling, the physical changes that happen when we, in our bodies, when we experience those emotions. And given that, more recently, others uh, have proposed that the insula's role in interoception should make it a player in emotion and in disorders of emotion. So you might think of the insula as the primary conduit for passing interoceptive information into the brain for integrating the physical experience of our emotions. And if that's the case, then you might expect that emotional disorders would be associated with abnormal activity in this region of the brain, in the insula. And uh, to explore this, we um, started doing research with patients with major depressive disorder. All right, so major depressive disorder is uh, a mood disorder that causes significant long-term impairment in mood and quality of life. All right. um, depression or major depressive disorder can manifest with lots of different types of symptoms, but the most, the most common ones are a depressed mood and what we would call anhedonia. Right? So anhedonia is a loss of interest in pleasure. But what most people don't realize is um, a serious, um, sort of moderate to severe major depressive uh, disorder is also associated with all sorts of somatic or body complaints. So depressed patients often experience chronic fatigue, headaches, um, heightened sensitivity to pain. They'll experience changes in their appetite and their eating behavior, um, and often a sense of sort of depersonalization, not being in touch with their bodies. So to, um, to understand uh, so given that, we thought this was an interesting and important model to look at for this visceral interoceptive attention task and to look at maybe what the insula's role in interoception might be. So we recruited um, 20 uh, adults who were unmedicated, uh, who had major depressive disorder, and then 20 uh, adults who were uh, uh, healthy, who'd never had any sort of uh, depression or psychiatric illness. And uh, we asked them to perform this visceral interoceptive attention task that I described a minute ago while they were in the scanner. And, and the first thing we did was we compared their brain activity while they're engaged in interoception, but between these two groups. And when we look, for example, at, um, at what brain regions anywhere in the brain that show differences between these two groups in activity during heartbeat interoception, one of the most prominent regions we observed was bilaterally the left and the right dorsal mid-insula, the same region that I showed you earlier um, with the healthy control subjects that seems to be the primary viscerosensory cortex. We also observed uh, differences between the group in the amygdala, which is another region that's been associated with emotion. And, uh, and in all of these cases, what we observed was decreased activity in, for example, the dorsal mid-insula for heartbeat interoception in the depressed subjects relative to the healthy control subjects. Now, interestingly, this didn't just hold for uh, heartbeat interoception. It also held for stomach and bladder interoception. So in heartbeat, stomach, and bladder interoception, uh, we, we observed statistically real, uh, significant differences between the depressed group and the healthy control group. Now, interestingly, the uh, activity in the left uh, insula was negatively correlated with depression severity. Right? So what that means is that the activity in this region of the dorsal mid-insula, when people were engaged in heartbeat interoception, this, this uh, heartbeat attention, was predictive of how, uh, how ill they were. So the more, um, the more abnormal your dorsal mid-insula activity was, the more uh, severely depressed you were. And in fact, this relationship between dorsal mid-insula activity and depression severity appear to be driven by the subject's somatic complaints. So what we observed was that those individuals who had the most somatic complaints, right, those depressed individuals who had the most somatic complaints, meaning the most, they reported the most headaches, um, chronic fatigue, changes in appetite, those sorts of things, those were the individuals uh, who showed uh, the most abnormal activity relative to healthy controls. So, depressed subjects exhibit less activity within the dorsal mid-insula during interoception, and as depression severity uh, and somatic symptoms associated with depression increase, activation within this region, the dorsal mid-insula, during interoception becomes more abnormal, 
All right, now this certainly makes the case that interoception plays a role in depression, but how does this relate to floating? Well, to get at that question, right, on the basis of these findings in healthy subjects and in, in patients with mood disorders, we think, um, we think that we've got a task that maps this region that is involved in interoception, interoceptive attention, right? And we think that floating um, alters interoceptive attention. I told you the story to begin with of my experience in the float tank. Um, so we decided as part of the studies that we're doing, the, the float studies that we're doing at LIBOR, to um, um, include this visceral interoceptive attention task. So in the data I'm gonna be showing today, which again are, are preliminary, we're not finished with the study, but uh, in the preliminary findings, uh, what I'm gonna be showing you is data from um, uh, comparing the two groups, right? So we've got, just by, by way of review, we've got a float group and we've got a chair group. And both of those groups, they perform at baseline this visceral interoceptive attention task. And then they also perform um, the visceral interoceptive attention task after repeated float sessions or repeated chair sessions. And what we wanna know is we wanna know are there brain regions look anywhere in the brain, are there brain regions that show um, differences between those groups as a function of, of the time of measurement? And when we look at that, we observe, lo and behold, that the insula is showing effects. So repeated floating, well, actually at, at the point of just looking at this map, you don't know exactly what's driving the effect, but you know that there's differences between the groups uh, as a function of pre versus, uh, versus post um, uh, um, pre versus post uh, training, um, you know there's a difference and it's in the insula, right? It's in the same region that we talked about. And now if we look at, for example, this spot right here, which is actually the same region of the dorsal mid insula that we observed in those earlier studies, what we see is that in the chair condition, pre versus post, there's really no difference in terms of the activity during uh, visceral interoceptive attention uh, in, in those, those, those two conditions, those two time points. But in the float group, something significant is happening. There's a repeated, repeated float sessions appear to modify the interoceptive insula activity. And this is one of the things, again, this is preliminary, but this is one of the things that we're gonna continue to follow and as we add subjects and we finish out the study, um, we're gonna be looking to see whether or not this effect holds up. So, um, neuroanatomy and brain imaging say that the posterior and mid insula is where many body signals reach the cortex, and this region is indeed implicated in some mental illnesses, right? So we talked about that. Now, preliminary evidence suggests that repeated floating alters brain activity in the insula. I just showed you that. So Saib showed, I'm mean, sorry, Justin showed you this slide last year, and then Saib brought it up again, and, and I just want to put this up here again to just think about for a second what we think is happening in the float environment. So in the float environment, um, we are reducing the, the signals that come into the brain on different sensory modalities. So we're reducing vision, we're reducing the proprioceptive cues, we're reducing what you hear, we're reducing your tactile sens sens uh, sensations, we're reducing how much you move, we're reducing uh, certainly how much you speak, right, because you're in there by yourself, hopefully. Um, and, uh, and as a result, what you're left with are your internal body sensations. Uh, the idea, the way I sort of think about this, and, and the, the data that Saib just showed you, I think really speak to this, is that you're, it's almost as if you're increasing the signal to noise ratio of your interoceptive sensations. By reducing all of these, the relative strength, relative to all the other sensory channels you have, the relative strength of your interoceptive signals goes way up. So the float environment may facilitate the brain's processing of interoceptive signals. And based on some new ideas about brain function, this facilitated interoceptive processing may tell us something about the long-term effects of floating. All right, so what do I mean by new ideas about brain function? Well, in the last 15 years, really, there's been kind of a paradigm shift happening in neuroscience, how we think about what the brain does. So the old way to think about the brain was that the brain was sort of a passive computational engine, right? The new way of thinking about uh, what the brain does is that it's an active inference generator. 
so rather than passively simply receiving sensory inputs, right, which was sort of the old way of thinking about it, that, the, that what was happening was sensory inputs would come into the brain, the brain was passively sort of waiting for those signals to come in, and then it would start doing lots and lots and lots of computations on those signals, right, those sensory signals, and it would compute ultimately perceptions, and, and you could think of it as uh, those perceptions as causes of those sensory information. Um, that rather than thinking about the brain as this sort of passive computational engine, the brain may instead um, act as a, may actively predict the causes of sensations according to the principles of Bayesian probability. Now, in a minute, I'm going to explain what that means, so let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Now, at present, um, the uh, empirical evidence uh, uh, for this sort of active inference account of, of brain function comes primarily from studies of the visual system, uh, from auditory systems, and from motor systems, but you really get a sense of how much this is sort of changing, how much this is sort of catching on in the neuroscience literature. This is a figure from Kanai and colleagues uh, uh, from uh, 2014, and what they did was they just looked at the occurrences in the scientific literature, uh, the co-occurrences in the scientific literature of the words Bayesian and brain. And you can see for a long time, it's just down here, there's just nothing. And then all of a sudden, bam, there's like this exponential growth where this idea is catching on and people start to think, begin to think differently about how the brain uh, functions. Now, recently, as in like this year, uh, a colleague of mine uh, at Northwestern University in Boston, Lisa Feldman Barrett, uh, Lisa and I uh, proposed an implementation of this active inference account of brain functioning uh, for interoception and how the brain is aware uh, and processes um, sensory information from inside the body. And we called it the EPIC model, and EPIC stands for Embodied Predictive Interoception Coding Model. And that'll make a little more sense as I describe this model. So the idea goes something like this, that certain limbic brain regions issue predictions about the causes of body sensations according to Bayesian principles of active inference. We're going to get to that in a second. And these predictions, what happens is these brain regions um, issue these predictions and send them to viscerosensory cortex. All right? And then in this viscerosensory cortex, it takes those predictions, those prediction signals, and then it also takes the incoming viscerosensory input from the body, and it compares them, and it computes the difference between those two signals, and it sends that difference score, or that prediction error, back up to the prediction brain regions. And the prediction brain regions use that information and alter their predictions and send the next prediction down, right? And then it does the prediction error computation again, and then it sends it back to the prediction regions. And you get this iterative loop where eventually you settle in on uh, a best fit prediction for what the sensory, the cause of the sensory input is. The important point I want you to get from this is that the idea here is we perceive that which we predict. So your perceptions are actually your brain's predictions of the causes of the sensory input. So what brain regions are we talking about? Well, based on um, uh, a lot of work looking at the connections among brain regions and the, the cellular structure of the brain regions, we think that these prediction regions, which would be in this figure in green, which are referred to as agranular cortex, that tells you something about their cellular structure, that these agranular uh, uh, prediction regions issue their predictions, send them to uh, viscerosensory cortex, which is back in mid and posterior insula, which we, we saw that in the earlier studies, and that these regions then produce, uh, uh, generate those prediction error computations and send them back to the prediction regions, and then that's where you get that loop going back and forth between the regions. Now, the key point that I want you to get here is that these predictions are generated according to principles of Bayesian probability. All right, so I'm gonna show you something, and I don't want anybody to freak out, okay? <laughs> I've been warned. <laughs> I've been warned, like, like, don't, don't, okay, just go with me. We're not gonna, this is not gonna be a test, all right? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk with you about this equation, which is Bayes' theorem, and, and what I hope to show you is that something about this actually tells us something really interesting about floating and why floating has the effects that it does. So Bayes' theorem was uh, um, uh, sort of came, 
generated by Thomas Bayes, who was a 18th century Presbyterian minister. He was Reverend Bayes. He also turned out to be uh, a very good statistician and mathematician. And, um, and the idea behind Bayes' theorem is that um, the probability of an event is based on information related to that event. So let me walk you through this, all right? So you have some probability uh, of a hypothesis given the evidence that's available to you. And then you have what we call the priors, right, or the prior, and that's the prior probability of that hypothesis itself. And then you have the likelihood of the evidence if the hypothesis is true, and the prior probability that the evidence itself is true. The, the thing I want you to get from this is if you look over here, right, this prior, that tells you something about your past experiences, right? This tells you something about the evidence, right? That's the, the, the context, that's the current information, and particularly this likelihood term in, uh, in the equation it is telling you something about the quality of the evidence, right? So um, uh, you could imagine, for example, that I have some sensation that I, I'm receiving from my, from my lungs, from my breathing, and so I have to decide whether my breathing may or may not feel constricted and anxious. So to, to compute that, I'm going to um, take the lifetime of experience that says my breath sometimes feels anxious, but at other times doesn't. And I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna, uh, include that along with how likely it is that I would have this breath sensation if I was anxious. Right? And in the, uh, the denominator here, we've got the prior probability that my breath feels the way it does right now. Now, if you take somebody who has an anxiety disorder, um, there's something interesting that begins to happen. So there's a lot of evidence, empirical evidence, as well as uh, sort of theoretical accounts from guys like Martin Paulus and, and Murray Steen uh, that say that for reasons uh, that we don't totally understand, we believe there's pathophysiology that cause in, in the body and in the brain that causes interoceptive signals to be noisy in individuals with anxiety disorders. And so as a result, of that, right? The quality of these interoceptive signals are degraded relative to, say, a healthy control subject. Now, in the context of, of Bayes, Bayesian probability, what that's going to do is that's going to have the function of shrinking the, the, the evidence, right? And the quality, the likelihood and quality of this evidence. And what that means is in your computation of how you feel, right? your priors are going to carry relatively more weight in the computation of the, of the posterior distribution, which is, which is this term here. Um, so as a result, your lifetime experience that says my breath often feels constricted and anxious is going to sort of carry more weight. And so we think this may account for why noisy interoception may lead to uh, predictions of anxiety in, in patients with anxiety disorder. But now think about what happens in the float tank. So you go in the float tank and everything gets dark, right? And as we, as we pointed out, we think that what happens in, the, in, in floating is that there is an increase in the signal-to-noise ratio of these interoceptive signals, right? Those signals get bigger, and the quality, therefore, of those signals gets greater. And where is that going to have its effect? It's going to have it on this, this, uh, this evidence term, on the likelihood. And as a result, the relative contribution of your priors, of your past experience uh, in the computation of the posteriors is going to go down. And, um, and you can think of it almost like, and to put it in colloquial terms, it's almost like the present moment, right? The present evidence is what's driving your experience more, right? And that's what happens in the float tank. It's a speculation on part. I really want to underline the word speculation, but we're going to start to do studies to try and, and, and understand this. But I think this may account for why it is that so many people, when they get in the float, um, in the float environment, in the float pool, begin to um, feel a sense of, of calm and sort of presentness. I told you, Bayes' theorem can tell you something about floating. <laughs> All right. So we have, good, we have a good idea of which brain regions underlie interoceptive sensation and perception. And many of the same regions uh, are implicated in mood and anxiety disorders. We, we talked about those regions. 
Flotation seems to modulate interoceptive awareness, possibly by increasing the signal-to-noise ratio of body signals. And as a result, flotation may have beneficial effects for some mood and anxiety disorders. But here's the thing, if we're gonna answer that, you know, the question about whether or not that's the case, it's time to do the randomized control trials to find out for sure. And that's actually what's happening at LIBOR now. And that's what Saib was talking about earlier, and that's what Justin's gonna be talking about uh, uh, after the break. Thank you. <laughs>